Welcome everyone to the June Glaze webinar. Today is really exciting, it's a little bit different. Usually we have guests speak, we have researchers, we have growers, uh, but today we're going to have our own researchers from Glaze speak and we're going to talk a little bit about our own organization. So the topic of today's webinar is a showcase of greenhouse lighting technology and Glaze research. Uh, so we're going to have a few short research talks. The first one will be by Timothy Shelford from Rutgers University, then Elsabeth Comos from Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute, and then Neil Madsen from Cornell University. But first, we're going to look a little bit into Glaze as an organization, and it is my honor to introduce Gretchen schimmel fennig who is our new executive director. Um, so she is going to tell you a little bit about herself and then a little bit about Glaze, and then we will get into the research presentations. Uh, but before we start that, I just want to say we will have a bit of time at the end for questions. So if you have any questions, please submit those through the Q&A box, which you can find at the bottom of your Zoom screen, and we will get to those at the end. So Gretchen, take the floor. Nice, <laughs> nice to see all of you. Thank you very much for joining us today. Um, it's my pleasure to uh, participate in this showcase as my first webinar as Executive Director of Glaze. I'm excited to lead this academic consortium into an exciting new future. Um, we'll continue to do the three uh, major things that we do, um, research, education, and networking for uh, industry and growers. So uh, as you may know, or if you're not familiar with Glaze, we are a academic consortium based out of Cornell, Rutgers, and Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute. Um, the academic uh, researchers investigate emerging technologies, understand how these systems can achieve energy efficiency and improvements for plant growth and development for greenhouse and indoor cultivated crops. And then we share those insights with the market um, via trainings like this, uh, short courses, as well as in-person events like our annual summit. And then we also publish research and share our insights through conferences and our members. So we hope that you consider joining Glaze as a member. You can join as an individual, a grower, if you're a manufacturer or an industry partner. Um, we'd love to have you get access to additional members only resources as well as great networking opportunities. So Glaze has been around for uh, over five years and we've got some really exciting insights to share. And so today I think is a great example of the work that we do and the, the really cool things that our researchers are finding um, in their um, individual experiments. So uh, let me tell you a bit about myself. So I chose to lead Glaze as I've devoted more and more of my career uh, to the CEA industry. I'm an energy engineer. My uh, name is Gretchen Schimmelfennig. Uh, it means shiny penny um, in German or moldy penny, depending on who you ask, but that's the way to pronounce it, shiny penny Schimmelfennig. Um, I'm an industry expert in the CEA space, primarily on resource efficiency. How can we achieve uh, net zero energy or net zero carbon indoor farms and greenhouses? How can we now achieve what is being called climate smart agriculture? I bring to the table a variety of expertise from different types of buildings, industries, and engineering. So um, commissioning is where I started my career. Commissioning is you know, functionally testing buildings to make sure that they operate as intended, whether in new construction or in renovations. And so I got to touch a lot of different types of buildings from data centers to hospitals to office buildings and um, worked for utility efficiency program here in Vermont where I live uh, and designed and implemented programs for commercial and industrial buildings. And that's when I sort of determined that uh, there was a potential for efficiency programs for growers that we didn't yet have in Vermont. And so I worked with our utility here in um, Vermont, Efficiency Vermont, to collaborate to make some LED grow light rebates. And that's when I sort of pivoted my career to focus more and more on the CEA industry. Most recently, I was the Technical Director of Resource Innovation Institute, where I implemented a market transformation project for controlled environment agriculture that was funded by the USDA. And today, I'm also an engineer at a firm in San Francisco and lead up our emerging technologies research um, for things like greenhouses and farms in California. So um, you can reach me at my Cornell email address that's on the screen here and um, look forward to connecting with you hopefully as a member or as a learner in our, in our educational curriculum. So tell you a little bit more about Glaze on the next couple slides. 
Um, we are very glad to have a robust membership of diverse actors in the CEA space. Thank you for being members. And we hope to continue growing as we expand our reach um, beyond our current focus on New York and continue working in other regions and potentially other countries. So as you can see on the next slide, we have international members who see that potential. Um, we have members across the world that we definitely want to continue leveraging our relationships with so that we can continue doing the work that we do in new places. So um, thank you to being, thank you to all of our members for being part of this transformation effort. And uh, one of our active initiatives in New York State uh, that is in progress is our New York State Greenhouse Database and Benchmark Tool, a collaboration funded by NYSERDA and implemented by the state's FlexTech consultants. If you wanna learn more about this tool, you can check it out at glaze.org benchmark. And we are well on our way, um, getting the first reports out and continuing to recruit greenhouses to participate. So this is a free service for growers to get a, um, a third party audit, step on the scale, get an understanding of their energy performance and get recommendations on how to improve uh, efficiency for crop production. And as we get more growers participating, eventually there will be a kind of comparison showing them how they stack up amongst the state's growers. I mentioned that one of the things we do is uh, educational events and networking events. So uh, we hope to see you at the Glaze Summit this year. Um, we are locating it in Ontario, in Leamington. And we just launched a registration for um, everyone to be able to access had early registration for members, and we are currently lining up some great speakers. So uh, come learn about this uh, really great uh, focus area of greenhouse uh, industry in Canada and learn more about how Glaze is going to hopefully do some cool work in the region as well. Um, Haley, I think that's it. Thank you so much for letting me introduce myself, and I'm really excited to hear about the kind of milestones we've achieved with our researchers. Great, thank you. Next up, we have Tim Shelford with some updates from Rutgers Glaze Research. Okay. Uh, thanks, Haley and Gretchen. Um, yeah, so uh, what I'm going to be talking about today is um, uh, sort of Rutgers, or part of Rutgers' contribution to the Glaze Project, um, which is uh, work that I do with uh, Professor AJ Both um, at Rutgers. And uh, we use his integrating sphere, which is a, um, a very fancy piece of equipment that we use to um, measure the, the efficacies and the performance of um, um, lighting fixtures, with specifically horticultural lighting fixtures. Um, so we measured uh, a whole bunch of lamps, and over the course of ways we've measured um, not, probably about 50 or so. Um, but uh, for this paper, we looked at 18 lamps. Uh, three fluorescents, uh, low pressure sodium, metal halide, ceramic metal halide, high pressure sodium, um, as well as a whole bunch of LED ones. Um, and we also included um, solar radiation as a comparison as well. And we looked at them for a number of performance characteristics, um, you know, sort of the typical ones, but we also included uh, the new definition um, or the new measurement of EPAR, which I'm gonna talk about a little bit later. So this work that we did is uh, an attempt to sort of add to and update uh, an older paper from 1983. Uh, that's why we also include some of the older um, horticultural lighting fixtures that are maybe not used as much in greenhouses anymore, but um, we wanted to put them in just to, to have a comparison with the original paper. Um, so this is a picture, uh, I'm, I'm sorry, it's not the greatest, but it was one of the only ones I had um, of the integrating sphere where we're actually testing a, a water-cooled one. So um, AJ actually trusted me enough to plumb uh, a water-cooled system into the um, integrating sphere. Um, we can see that picture on the, on the, on the right there. Um, on the left is just an example of a, another lamp that we, we hang in the integrating sphere. And basically the integrating sphere measures all of the um, spectral output of the lamp and other equipment that we have measures the energy that goes into the lamp. So basically the, the wall plug energy that is going into the lamp. And so by dividing the spectral output by the um, energy that goes in, we can get various measures of, of efficacy. 
So the spectrum that we're particularly interested in is, uh, is the visible light and what we usually call PAR. And PAR has been defined as the um, light between 400 and 700 nanometers. So um, I mentioned EPAR, and, and it's a new sort of measurement um, where basically researchers have found that there is some more photosynthesis um, due to radiation that's in the 700 to 750 nanometer wave band. So just a little bit outside of the traditional PAR one. And so they proposed using, um, calling this EPAR or extended PAR, and um, basically to predict the amount of available radiation for photosynthesis. So it's, it's only really on that, um, on the 700 to 750 end, um, we don't really see any effects um, below the 400. So um, the EPAR really is just sort of extending the, the upper, um, upper range of the, uh, of the spectrum. Um, so of course, this is going to be confusing because, uh, you know, we have some definition, this definition of PAR, which is very well defined and has been in use for, for many years now. And adding in another one um, can create a little bit of confusion, um, you know, which, which measure are we using, but um, that's, that's what we're going with uh, moving forward, it looks so. Um, so this does have an, um, an impact on the measure of efficacy though. And so we have to be very careful about how we report that. Um, so this is just a typical um, LED fixture spectral output. We, we can see there's um, peaks in the blue and then there's there's some um, you know, peak in the red and there's a little bit of white in here too. But um, with the tr traditional measure of PAR between 400 and 700, um, it does cut out um, quite a bit of the tail um, between 700 and 800. And so um, for this, this one, we have a, an efficacy of 1.44 micromoles of photosynthetically active radiation um, photons uh, per joule. Um, but we can see if we include the, the EPAR, um, that 700 to 750, um, there's more of those photons are being counted towards um, photosynthetically active radiation. And so um, the efficacy increases. So um, these are the spectral output of um, just some of the 18 lamps that we, we reported on in that paper, um, along with the solar radiation. Um, and we can see that a lot of them do have um, significant amounts of um, radiation above the 700 to 750, um, particularly the ceramic metal halides, um, the, the high pressure sodiums, um, they, they definitely have a significant amount there. Uh, whereas some of the um, LED ones um, with sort of their narrows, um, narrow uh, spectra uh, do not, um, such as the, the one in the bottom right corner, the helio spectra, um, there's not very much in the 700 to 750 nanometer range. So um, yeah, again, this is not all of the 18, but just some of them, um, we can see uh, the effect that it's had on the efficacy overall for reporting PAR or EPAR efficacy. Um, so for cool white fluorescence, you know, there's a few percentage um, improvements. Um, I think the best one is the, um, the high pressure sodium um, in terms of improvements of, of efficacy. Um, and we can see with a, an LED fixture that is, is strictly red and blue, um, there is no improvement um, since there's no, or they don't have very many photons in that 700 to 750 range. Um, so you might look at these um, efficacies and think they're, they're pretty low, and, and they are. Um, we, uh, compared to a lot of published values, for some reason, we seem to be, we measure a little bit lower. Um, you know, we've had everything calibrated and checked out, but, um, you know, we suspect you know, they might be testing the, the fixtures that are absolutely the best and cherry, cherry picking sort of the, the best results um, when they're reporting them. Um, you know, we only test, you know, one fixture that we get and, and these are the values that, that, we, that we get. Um, so currently uh, the best fixture that we've tested is the um, Corda LED um, top two. And um, with uh, a little bit of, it's mostly red and, and blue, but there's a little bit of white and, you know, magenta in it. Um, and we found out that it was actually more efficient when it was only run at 50% output. Um, a 
fixtures that are use active cooling, such as fan cooling, um, they have lower efficacies because they're they're using power to cool the lamp down, um, and that's power that's not going into creating photons. Um, the uh, fixtures that have um, you know a broader spectrum tend to be less efficient as well that in terms of the LEDs uh, because the the blue blue LEDs are the most efficient and the way that they get that sort of daylight or, or wider spectrum is to um, put a doping um, and that that reduces the efficacy so um, yeah that was basically what I wanted to talk about today um, if you wanted to see the paper um, it's free to download um, at this link so um, with that I will turn things over to else. Okay. So thank you to Tim for introducing the power spectrum. So I will <laughs> talk about the applied aspects of this. So we have recently finished a project uh, with growing tomatoes under soil source lighting. And we wanted to uh, ask the question if it matters which wavelength of the blue light you're using. Um, but first, uh, I would like to briefly review why um, we chose to study tomato and remind you that tomato is actually a fruit. Uh, worldwide, tomatoes is, is the biggest crop in terms of production. So that's the graph here on the left. Um, and uh, so you can actually compare tomato to other fruits like apples and bananas. And the interesting thing is also that tomato production has increased a lot. It has basically doubled over the past 30 years or so. Uh, and interesting also for tomato production is and compared to other fruits, it's, it's, it's also produced in indoor environments such as greenhouses and what if confines, whereas apples and bananas and grapes are mainly produced outdoors, of course. And on the right part of the slide, I just want to illustrate that tomato intake is very important for vitamin C for humans. Um, as we all know, and I think common knowledge is that oranges are the most important crop for vitamin C intake, but tomato, because it's so popular food, both as a processed food and a fresh food, uh, tomato is actually number two crop for vitamin C intakes for people. Uh, but even though also tomato has a very low content compared to orange of oh, vitamin C. Um, and the last uh, graph here shows that, uh, what was it? Uh, normally the most popular fruit is thought of, and I would say would be apples, but actually tomato is uh, consumed a lot, and apple is number four. Okay, so the project that we did was to test uh, the wavelength of blue light um, to the blue spectral quality, and the LED modules that we're using, the research tiger lights, have the ability, have, have three different blue channels, the 400, the 420, and the 450. So throughout this presentation, I call those respectively violet, indigo, and blue light. Um, it's a, a wide spectrum though, because we also add green and red and flower to the spectrum. As indicated here, we have equal amounts of flower and blue light, a double amount of green light, and about two thirds of the spectrum is the red light. And the plants will grow in gross cabinets with hydroponic uh, deep water reservoirs, as you can see in the photo. And this is a small scale experiment because we only can fit six uh, plants in the end in, in this uh, facility. But everything was repeated three times for each of the different blue light conditions. And then we also included fluorescent light as a control, even though fluorescent light is normally not uh, used anymore. And the culture I used was a microtom tomato, which of course is a dwarf tomato and also used a lot for other plant science studies. 
And then thank you to Tim for introducing the, the power spectrum. Uh, I just wanted to highlight here that um, when we work with different blue LED channels, when you work with the 400 nanometer channel, uh, about half of uh, the light from that channel goes outside the power spectrum as indicated here. But for our experiments, the power uh, value, the, the flux was for power was the same in all experiments. So uh, violet, of course, then had the most uh, flux outside the power spectrum, whereas the indigo only had the tail of it going beyond the 400 nanometer into the UVA uh, band. So we grew the tomatoes for about 120 days after sowing. They were harvested when about two thirds of the fruits were ripe. So this slide shows the dry weight of the green biomass and the leaf area. Uh, so these are all back wraps with the fluorescent light in green and then the three different blue light spectral qualities for for the other bars, so violet, indigo, and blue. Um, so interestingly, we found that for violet and indigo, the, the dry biomass was uh, increased compared to the blue condition, but not different than fluorescence. And also the leaf area was different for, for blue. The leaf area for blue was smaller compared to two other LED conditions. Uh, you often also then calculate the specific leaf area, which is a measure of the thickness of the leaf, but that wasn't different for these uh, lighting conditions. Next, of course, we want to look at the fruit yield. Um, the first graph on the left here shows the total mass of fruit harvested. So as I said, we picked all the fruit when not all of the fruit was ready. So this is a measure of all the fruits, also the one that was still green. Uh, and we found that for violet and indigo, there was a higher mass of total fruit. When we then looked only at the ripe fruit, it was only for the indigo condition that was an increase compared in particular to the fluorescent condition. So, so um, of course, there's a variation between the trials. I hope you can see the three dots for each condition. Each dot is one experiment. Um, the size of the individual red fruits was not different as the loose, the other half of the slides shows here. Um, so we, we found a small increase for indigo in the harvest, but as I showed before that, the, the blue LED condition had a smaller biomass. So then uh, you can calculate the fruiting efficiency relative to biomass. And then interestingly, as you can see here, both with the fruit uh, relative to the total biomass weight of the plants and the fruit weight relative to the leaf area, uh, for the indigo and the blue condition, you got the best efficiency. So that was uh, interesting. Uh, we also looked at the fruit uh, quality. Um, so in general, blue light is known to promote the formation of secondary metabolites in plants, for example, ascorbate, phenolic acids, anthocyanin, flavonoids, and other compounds with antioxidant activity. Um, the first graph here shows a brick value, which you probably know is a measure of the total soluble solids, uh, for instance, sugars. And sugars, of course, are very important for food quality, but so for that measure, there was no difference. Um, the two other graphs shows uh, carotenoids, which are red and orange compounds to the pigment of the fruit. Um, uh, but we didn't see any significant difference between the conditions here. Um, one lycopene is a very uncommon uh, compound because it's uh, uh, it's not a vitamin, but it's an antioxidant, and beta carotene is 
is a precursor for vitamin E. Uh, we then measured the vitamin C content, so the ascorbic acid, uh, and we found that for the blue LED condition, it had a higher content of ascorbic acid, both to uh, comparison to violet and indigo, and also to fluorescent light. And the final graph here shows a total phenol content, which is also a measure of antioxidant activity, but the, that was not different between the conditions. Um, because we found the difference for the blue LED light, we also analyzed uh, other parameters for plant uh, physiology and, and growth efficiency. So this, these graphs shows the, the pigment content in the leaves. Uh, so the chlorophyll, the two different types of chlorophyll and total measure of carotenoids in the leaves. And in general, the LED condition uh, lowered the, the chlorophyll content compared to the fluorescent light. And then in the, the third plot here, you can see that the ratio of chlorophyll A and B was lower for the blue LED condition compared to the other condition. Um, so, the, so why the chlorophyll A, B ratio, why do you uh, calculate this? This ratio reflects the composition of the photosystems in the chloroplast. And you might remember that uh, there are two photosystems in the chloroplast membrane that where the photosynthesis takes place for the system one and two. And chlorophyll A and B is associated differently with these two photosystems. So that tells you about uh, the ratio of the photosystems are different uh, for blue compared to the other light conditions. And that can reflect how the plant has optimized photosynthesis depending on the light conditions. So, so that tells us that, you know, it does um, already show it does matter for, for food quality with vitamin C, that there's a difference for the blue light, but uh, here is actually some evidence what is going on that the plant is optimizing its uh, pigment content, pigment composition, depending on the light conditions. Um, during growth, we also measure the the rate of photosynthesis and also chlorophyll A fluorescence, which you might remember is a measure of light stress. So that is a plot on the right. There was no significant difference between the conditions. Um, the net photosynthetic rate on the left here, however, even though we have some variability in the data, it indicates that uh, under the blue condition, the, the rate of photosynthesis is actually better for blue light. So this could help explain why we see uh, the different phenotypes that I just showed you for the blue condition. Um, and then, so these measures were, you know, taken at, uh, after uh, about a month, one month, of course. So this is it's not in agreement with the chlorophyll uh, extraction data because, of course, that might also change, but that was an endpoint analysis. Uh, so finally, I want to show you that our results uh, are in agreement with two papers that came out recently. On top here is illustrated uh, a paper from Plant Cell where they identified a new kind of blue light a photoreceptor. You might know that cryptochrome is a very important receptor for blue light, but this is another receptor. And they nicely show that it's a blue light dependent uh, activity of this uh, photoreceptor with relation to vitamin C uh, uh, biosynthesis. So that nicely explains that blue light the mechanism behind why blue light is important for vitamin C synthesis. Uh, in the bottom paper, uh, they also work with tomato, uh, the microtom variety as well, 
and they analyzed two different LED spectra compared to fluorescent light, and those two LED spectra differed a little bit in the blue spectra quality. This channel peaked at 440, and the two, the RB and RDB, differs a little bit in the amount of uh, blue wavelengths at the end of the blue uh, spectrum there. And so they also found some differences. It's not exactly the same that we found, but again, it related to vitamin C content. And finally, I wanted to illustrate. <laughs> so I just modified the table a little bit from Tim and AJ's paper here with the different fixtures, the ones that are LED fixtures, and I added some from our glaze members. I just wanted to highlight that the most common blue light LED is the one that peaks at 450. And, and the fun fact is that this is not due to, to what I just showed you, that it promotes a vitamin C content in tomato. Um, this is just because of the general availability of this LED channels in the industry is the most common one. But if you look very closely, it can be hard to find uh, in the documentation for these fixtures what is actually the identity of the blue light channel. But there's a little bit of uh, selection available if you are interested in this. And of course, there are also a few companies that make fixtures that can be completely customized to what specifically you want to have for the blue light uh, uh, wave band. And then I just conclude here that the 450 blue light affects the biomass in tomato and also the yield. And if you look at the ratio, the fruit efficiency ratio, um, Indigo and blue are the best ones, and blue specifically promotes uh, vitamin C content. And it might go back to the, the, the chlorophyll, the pigment in the leaf has been optimized. To, uh, so the 450 actually is the best for, for the synthesis. That's all from me. Good afternoon. I'd like to talk about some of the greenhouse projects we've been doing with Glaze at Cornell University. Um, and in particular, I'm going to talk about one that we did uh, last year with, with dimmable LED lighting control um, for tomatoes and strawberries um, compared to our traditional high pressure sodium uh, lighting. And um, before I get started, I'd like to acknowledge um, our research team that worked on this project. Um, Tim Shelford and Melissa Cole worked on the algorithm development and implementation. Um, Nick Kazmar is a research support specialist that worked on our uh, lettuce and tomato trials. Um, and then Chris Levine is a recent uh, master's graduate from Cornell who worked on our strawberry trials. Uh, the particular LEDs that we used in the trial were from TSR Grow, um, who donated the fixtures, so I'd like to acknowledge them as well. So let me dive in, um, and in particular, we're going to talk about uh, this lighting control algorithm, and it all started with um, an algorithm called LASI, Light and Shade System Implementation, which was developed by Lou Albright at Cornell University. Um, and the goal of it was to improve daily light integral uniformity, so to determine when to um, add supplemental light during the day, um, as well as when to open and close retractable shade curtains. Um, and it also wanted to push uh, as much lighting as possible into the off-peak periods of the day. Just a second. Let me try to get this X gone. Good afternoon. I'd like to tell we're from TSR Grow, um, who donated the fixtures, so I'd like to acknowledge. Um, and in particular, we're going to talk about uh, this lighting control algorithm, and it all started with um, an algorithm called LASI, Light and Shade System Implementation, which was developed by Lou Albright at Cornell University. 
Um, and the goal of it was to improve daily light integral uniformity. So to determine when to um, add supplemental light during the day, um, as well as when to open and close retractable shade curtains. Um, and it also wanted to push uh, as much lighting as possible into the off peak periods of the day um, when electricity is cheaper. Um, a little bit more about LASI itself. LASI uses uh, measured values of solar radiation um, in the greenhouse at, at uh, crop canopy um, to make predictions about um, how much uh, natural light you'll get by the end of the day. Um, and the LASI algorithm uh, makes uh, decisions at each time point, and it tries to delay supplemental lighting um, decisions until it predicts that you can't meet your daily light integral target uh, without adding supplemental light. Um, so it attempts to shift supplemental lighting hours to cheaper off-peak periods. Um, and then uh, this algorithm was originally developed uh, for uh, lettuce. And in the case of lettuce, there is a um, penalty for giving the crop too much light, which is the physiological disorder tip burn. Um, so the LASI algorithm also um, controls deployment of retractable shade curtains to reduce incoming light um, during high light times of the year. Um, so uh, with Glaze, we've been working on updating the LASI control algorithm um, to take advantage of capabilities that we have from LED fixtures. And in particular, LEDs give us the ability to dim or control the light output um, on and off um, rapidly. And so we've developed what we call real-time LASI, which makes decisions about what level of light uh, to provide on a much finer time scale. Um, we can do it uh, quicker than one to 10 minutes. Um, currently we've implemented at a, at a 10 minute scale um, compared to the original LASI algorithm, which operated on a one hour time scale. Um, and also with this real time LASI, we complement the sun. Um, so depending on how much sunlight we get into the greenhouse, we adjust the um, light output of our fixtures um, to a maximum um, instantaneous uh, lighting target or PPFD. Um, in a sense, what this does is it helps to spread um, lighting out over the course of a day. Um, a little bit about uh, the implementation at Cornell University. So we installed uh, two greenhouse sections at Cornell with these TSR uh, grow LED fixtures. Um, and then to um, uh, talk to the fixtures, we installed Argus um, dimming output modules. So Argus is our climate control system in the greenhouse, um, and we installed these dimming output modules um, that our algorithm talks to um, that adjusts uh, light output in a 10 minute time cycle. Um, and so uh, we implemented real time LASI, the control algorithm on um, these little microcontrollers that are called Arduinos or Raspberry Pis. Um, and these are connected to a, a um, quantum sensor, a PPFD sensor that's at uh, plant canopy height and a representative spot in the greenhouse. And then that, com that uh, communicates with the Arduino Raspberry Pi system, which then communicates with, with Argus through a um, Modbus um, communication port. Um, and when we set this up, we had to develop a calibration curve, which was basically uh, looking at uh, different intensities of light um, that we could get from the LED array um, and then the um, current signal or the output uh, command um, that we would give to achieve a target uh, light level. Um, and in these particular lights, we could dim them down to about 50 uh, micromoles per meter squared per second. Um, here's an example day with real time LASI control. Um, and so in this case, um, uh, this tells us how much supplemental light we got during a day. Um, and so past noon, um, we were dependent on all natural light. Um, and then by the time we got uh, to um, the late afternoon, uh, we started to call for, the algorithm started to call for light. Um, and at first, we only needed about 150 micromoles of light, um, and there was still some sun. Um, and that was to reach, in this case, a 300 micromole per meter squared per second target. Um, and then um, later, as the um, afternoon progressed into evening, we needed a higher amount of light. Um, and then finally, once the sun went down, um, we, we had output at um, 300 micromoles per meter squared per second. And then um, just after midnight, we reached our daily light integral target. 
Um, and here's the accumulated uh, daily light integral over a day. I guess this is a different day um, than the, the one that was used in the prior example. Um, but essentially, we had um, sunlight um, in the morning, um, and then we started to um, add on to it. Um, and then we got, we accumulated a very uh, uniform daily light integral as we progressed. Um, and then a little after um, midnight, we had reached our 20 uh, mole uh, per meter squared per day target for daily light integral for this crop. Uh, so that was a bit of a description of the algorithm itself. Um, so I want to talk about two experiments we conducted at Cornell University to compare performance of cherry tomatoes um, and then day neutral strawberries under real time Lassie with LEDs compared to high pressure sodium lights. So our LED treatment, um, these, this is pictured here on the left, had um, the TSR grow LED fixtures. Their efficacy um, was about 2.4 micromoles per joule. Compared that to our high pressure sodium light treatment, which were 1000 watt uh, HPS fixtures with an efficacy of about 1.6 micromoles per joule. Um, in the case of our tomato experiment, we had a set daily light integral target of 25 moles per meter squared per day. Um, and so that was with either on off high pressure sodium lights or it was using real time Lassie where we would dim um, and adjust light intensity every 10 minutes um, to an instantaneous lighting target of 400 micromoles per meter squared per second. Um, and this uh, graph shows us the um, the spectra that we were dealing with. So the high pressure sodium light is the blue shaded uh, spectrum um, and uh, high pressure sodium light does not have a lot of uh, blue light. Um, and then there's a large peak into the orange and red. Um, and then there is a tail into uh, far red as well. And then for the LED fixture, um, it was a, a white LED. Um, and so we had a peak in blue. Um, it was a phosphor coated uh, blue LED. Um, so we have that peak in blue and then we have these wider peaks um, that um, stretch uh, that, that light out um, across um, broader wavelengths, um, which make it appear white to our eyes. Um, and so this experiment, we had lighting treatments in adjacent greenhouses, um, which I had previously described. Um, the uh, climate set points were 74 degrees during the day and 66 degrees at night. Um, and then we used real-time Lassie over a three-month um, fruiting period um, in the case of that trial beginning um, in mid-July 2022. Um, and so we measured the um, yield of um, cherry tomatoes. The cultivar was um, uh, Merlis. Um, sorry, the cultivar was Sweetel. Uh, and, um, and so the dash line here shows us where the lighting treatments began. Um, and especially after we began the lighting treatments, we started to see a separation um, in terms of um, the yield that we got, where we did get higher um, uh, yield in terms of uh, fresh weight harvested of fruit under the LED treatment. Um, in terms of the overall um, yield per truss or per cluster of fruit um, that was also higher under the, the LED treatment versus the HPS treatment. Um, and this was due to um, larger um, size per fruit um, rather than having um, more fruit uh, per truss. Um, so larger fruit size under LEDs because um, we did not see a difference in the, the fruit count or the number of fruit per cluster. Um, and then we also measure, measured um, bricks or soluble sugar uh, content um, and bricks or sweetness of the fruit was higher, however, um, under high pressure sodium light as compared to um, the LED treatment. Um, just a little bit about uh, um, temperature under the two treatments. So again, the treatments, uh, the lighting treatments began um, where we see the dashed lines here. Um, and so we have um, day temperature in this um, reddish uh, line uh, for HPS on the left and LED on the right. Um, and then the night temperature um, is in the, the blue line. So overall, not huge differences in um, temperature. Um, here's a, a picture of the HPS treatment with the tomatoes growing. So we had three rows of um, tomatoes that were growing in the experiment. Um, and this is the um, LED uh, plants that were under LED lighting. 
Uh, so to summarize the tomato work, um, real-time Lassie with LED lighting led to about a 30% greater tomato yield versus high-pressure sodium light, even though we supplied them um, the same daily light integral um, target. Um, and overall, this increase in yield was associated with increased fruit size, but not increased um, fruit number. Um, however, bricks or sol soluble sugar content was higher on high-pressure sodium uh, grown fruit. Um, as compared to the LED treatment with uh, real-time Lassie. And so these um, plant yield and BRICS responses, um, this is uh, speculation on what might explain these differences, um, but they could be due to the impact of high pressure sodium light on plant temperature. Um, so with HPS light, we do get uh, long wave uh, radiation that can warm um, the leaf canopy. Um, however, the air temperature itself was very similar between both treatments. Um, and so maybe for the plant, um, either these, these temperature responses or light quality responses uh, guided the plant in terms of um, fruit size and yield versus um, bricks. And we know that the plant does experience some trade-offs in terms of how it can allocate its carbohydrates toward um, more fruit or more flavorful fruit. Um, overall, the implementation of real-time LASI with LED lighting led to about a 33% um, uh, electrical savings while delivering the same daily light integral. Um, and there is need for further experimental replication to go beyond the size of our um, small experimental greenhouse sections. Then I want to talk about our um, work using this algorithm for strawberries. Um, and we used two cultivars of day neutral strawberries. They were Cabrillo and Albion. Um, they were transplanted into 11 liter troughs with four plants per trough. Uh, moved into the respective greenhouses, um, and the size of the plants was um, built up um, to uh, fruiting size before we started the lighting treatments. And then on April 20th of 2022 is when we started um, the lighting treatments. And then uh, fruiting yield data was collected for three months. Um, and within each greenhouse, we then had um, three replicate blocks or rows, which each contained four troughs of Albion and four troughs of Cabrillo. Um, so 24 crop troughs per greenhouse. Um, and the spacing accounting for the aisles was about one plant per square foot, which is similar to commercial spacing. In the case of strawberries, we had a daily light integral target of 20 moles per meter squared per day. Um, and we used uh, real-time Lassie with LEDs with an instantaneous lighting target of 300 micromoles per meter squared per second. Um, and then the um, high pressure sodium lights had the traditional on off Lassie. Our climate set points were 72 degrees Fahrenheit during the day and 57 degrees at night. And then in terms of maintenance, besides harvesting the, the fruit and measuring them, we uh, removed old leaves and runners uh, weekly. So here's a view of the um, strawberry trials under the LEDs. Um, and then the strawberries that were under the high pressure sodium uh, light treatment. Um, and so um, this graph shows us the daily light integral. Um, blue is for the high pressure sodium treatment and red is for the LED treatment. Um, there were some cases where the daily light integral was below target. And those are actually cases where we had to manually um, turn off the fixtures on those days um, to apply um, biofungicides, which we used uh, periodically for powdery mildew control. Um, and then we also had a day or two where there was, uh, I guess, user error where we had higher daily light integral than expected. And that would be the, the um, fixtures were turned on for demonstration purposes manually um, and then forgot uh, to be turned off. Um, overall, we did hit our 20 mole target with the high pressure sodium lights. And then with the LEDs, um, we were um, just about 5% under that target at about 19 moles. Um, in this experiment, we did use an infrared uh, radiometer, um, so a device that can measure um, surface temperature of the leaves in our case, and then that was connected to a data logger, um, and there was one in the HPS greenhouse and one in the LED greenhouse so that we could measure the leaf uh, temperature for each of the, the lighting treatments. Um, and um, this graph uh, shows us of um, over time the difference in leaf temperature um, by um, treatment. So the LED temperature minus the high pressure sodium um, temperature. 
Um, and then um, the daily average is the yellow line. So on average, we were very close to um, zero. However, overall, the LED temperature was 0.2 degrees Celsius uh, lower um, at 20.4 degrees Celsius versus the high pressure sodium lights. Um, so a slight um, air, uh, leaf temperature effect of the lighting treatments. Um, in terms of cumulative uh, berry weight, we did see very positive results from LEDs. Um, so over the 14 week um, harvest period, starting at about four or five weeks after the lighting treatments began, um, we started to see separation in the treatments where the um, high pressure sodium light uh, grown plants um, yielded uh, less fruit than the um, LED treatments. And then um, we also did measure um, bricks uh, content um, or soluble sugar content. Um, in this case, um, between lighting treatment, there was no statistically significant difference. So if we look at cultivar Albion, for example, um, it had the same um, bricks um, under high pressure sodium light versus LED light. And then cultivar Cabrillo, which is a higher yielding cultivar, um, but not as um, sweet of tasting fruit, had lower uh, bricks, um, and that was statistically the same under high pressure sodium light versus uh, LED light. Um, with the strawberries, we also measured uh, titratable acidity, um, which is uh, sort of an unwanted, uh, we don't want berries that are too acidic, so kind of an unwanted characteristic. Um, and we found the same thing as uh, bricks, where there was not a difference uh, between uh, lighting treatments. Um, so Albion and Albion were the same. Um, and Cabrillo and Cabrillo were the same. So we did see a, a cultivar um, specific difference. So to summarize the work with strawberries, um, for both uh, Cabrillo and Albion, the real-time Lassie algorithm led to about a 45% greater strawberry yield versus high pressure sodium light. Um, and we speculate this could be due to the LED lighting spectrum or to the dimming strategy, so complementing the sun um, instead of turning the lights in a fashion that's all on or all off. Um, we did not see much of a, a leaf temperature effect of the lighting treatments, only 0.2 degrees Celsius on the, the leaves that we uh, measured and logged. Bricks and titratable acidity were not impacted by the lighting treatment, but were affected by cultivar. Um, Albion was greater than Cabrillo in the case of uh, bricks, for example. And then overall, the implementation of real-time Lassie with LED lighting led to a 33% um, electrical savings as compared to high pressure sodium lights. Um, and again, we should have increased um, experimental replication to move beyond our small um, research setting at Cornell. And I wanna thank you very much and I'll look forward to any questions that come out of our uh, talks today. Thank you so much. All right. Thank you everyone for those great presentations. Um, we have a, a question or two from the audience and then we can just have some discussion for the next six, seven minutes or so. Uh, so the first question we have from the audience is, is there any validation of information on intermittent lighting slash DLI to improve growth? Sure, I could take that one. Um, so um, daily light integral or the accumulated amount of light that we get during a day has has definitely been um, correlated with plant yield and productivity. Um, there's many studies. There's probably the most famous one uh, from 2006, Leo Marcellus at uh, Wageningen um, has a study on the correlation between DLI and, and plant yield. Um, but in terms of the intermittent question, that's, that's a very good question. Um, and so there has been research uh, from Mark Van Erzel's group at the University of Georgia that if you took the same DLI but spread it out across more hours of the day that you would see an improvement in um, plant growth um, and lettuce um, was one of the specific plants that they looked at in that case um, and you could think about it as kind of like a uh, an analogy might be for a human instead of having one huge meal a day um, 
uh, spreading our uh, meals out over like six small meals a day probably leads to um, happier humans. And so in the same way, not giving the plant all of their dose of light in one hour a day, um, you would be saturating photosynthesis at that point. So spreading that same amount of light out across the day um, so that you haven't saturated photosynthesis um, uh, has been shown in some research to uh, yield benefits. Great, thank you. Our next question um, about the LASI study. So I believe you said LEDs were 33% more efficient than HPS. So given the 33% energy savings, does that mean you can't attribute any energy savings to the LASI control alg algorithm? Oh, okay. So that's that's a good question. Um, so we did see, of course, the um, uh, just the fix the LED fixtures themselves were about 33% more efficient than the high pressure sodium lights. Um, they did also give greater plant yield, right? For, for example, like 30% higher plant yield. Um, so we didn't take that into account. Um, we should we should give an updated yield calculation that's like per kg of produce harvested, uh, we saved X amount of energy. Um, so we would see that additional um, savings accrue through the through the control algorithm um, and not just the LED implementation. Um, so that's a very good point. All right. Uh, one question I wanted to just put out to everyone is what other research is Glaze conducting right now? So I know we've gone really in depth into these three particular projects, but can we just give a brief overview of what other projects you're working on? Sure. So after the tomato work, we are basically doing the similar thing for strawberry <laughs> to see um, how is it the blue light in strawberry is also important for the the flavor and the nutritional quality, right? So we want to see if that's a difference there too. And um, we just wrapped up um, another winter's worth of research um, in our greenhouse where we um, uh, further expanded on real-time Lassie and we have real-time CO2 Lassie. So that's where we also supplement with carbon dioxide. And then we calculate a virtual daily light integral in a sense based on how much supplemented CO2 we have so that we can further reduce our um, daily light integral um, target. Um, so we expect to see some more energy savings from that, uh, but we'll have resu results coming out in the next few months here as we uh, process the, the data and do the statistical analysis. Um, and that was with uh, lettuce, strawberries, tomatoes, um, as well well as for cannabinoid uh, hemp. And just to add to that, um, we also have some more algorithm development uh, in terms of day ahead market pricing. And so to, to use uh, lower cost electricity to improve the, the, the price of implementing these, these algorithms, so um, among other things, so. And we also continue on with um, pilot trials where we're testing um, the Lassie control algorithm in commercial greenhouses. Um, we've done a couple of commercial greenhouses up to this point, and then we have a new um, New York State specialty crop block grant where we'll be implementing this in um, eight uh, commercial greenhouse spaces in New York State um, this coming um, field season. Um, and uh, there's also opportunities for commercial companies that would like to, to implement uh, Lassie and work with us to do that. So we realize as universities, we tend to test things at a um, R&D scale um, with our Arduinos and Raspberry Pis or, or data loggers that are at commercial greenhouses, but we'd love to um, work with um, manufacturers on a commercial implementation of the algorithm. Great, thank you. Uh, we have one last question from the audience about the tomato bricks results. Would the average consumer be able to detect that measured difference that you found in the tomato bricks? So um, I think food scientists have more um, research on this, um, but I seem to recall that if there's about a one degree difference in bricks, um, that's usually um, something that you can detect in the human palate. Um, so uh, we could definitely in the in the tomato work um, see a slight noticeable uh, difference in the bricks content uh, versus in the strawberries we didn't see a difference between lighting treatments but with cultivar you could you could taste that the Albion cultivar was sweeter than Cabrillo. 
All right, thank you. And thank you all again. That was a great overview of Glaze Research. And to all of you watching, of course, if you have any more questions about Glaze or want to, to get involved, please don't hesitate to contact any of us. Thank you so much and have a good day. Thank you. Bye.